Welcome back to the Citizen Scientist Workshop. I'm Dr. Sean, and in today's project, I'm going to show you how to weigh smoke. This topic provides a great introduction to some very important chemistry, so bear with me. There's a wonderful story, possibly apocryphal, about a bet that Queen Elizabeth I of England once made with the great explorer and her reputed boy toy, Sir Walter Riley. And it has to do with Sir Walter's cigar. In the 1995 movie Smoke, the great American actor William Hurt described what happened this way. Well, Raleigh was the person who introduced tobacco in England. And since he was a, a favorite of the Queen's, Queen Bess, he used to call her, smoking caught on as a fashion at court. I'm sure old, old Bess must have shared a stogie or two with Sir Walter. Once, he made a bet with her that he could measure the weight of smoke. You mean weigh smoke? Exactly. Weigh smoke. Can't do that. It's like weighing air. I admit it's strange. It's almost like weighing someone's soul. But Sir Walter was a clever guy. First, he took an unsmoked cigar, and he, he put it on a, a balance and, and weighed it. Then he lit up. He smoked a cigar, carefully tapping the ashes into the balance pan. When he was finished, he put the butt into the pan along with the ashes and weighed what was there. Then he subtracted that number from the original weight of the unsmoked cigar. The difference was the weight of the smoke. Measuring the weight of smoke has become an allegory in self-improvement circles for appreciating the impact of things that have left us, of relationships lost and opportunities missed that weigh down upon our spirits. The term has even crept into experimental psychology. But while Sir Walter's demonstration may have convinced his queen, it shouldn't have. You see, Sir Walter was wrong. The smoke must have weighed a good deal more than the mass lost by the cigar. Why? Simple chemistry. Something burns when you heat it up enough so that the chemical bonds in the stuff that it's made of break apart and then gobble up oxygen molecules in the air. For example, let's consider a pure fuel like octane, which is the major component of gasoline. It burns completely and leaves only the invisible gases of carbon dioxide and water vapor behind. And as it does, it liberates about 47 megajoules for each kilogram burned. Now, in an earlier video, I explained how to calculate the mass of any molecule if you know its atomic formula. It turns out that a single molecule of octane has a mass of 106 atomic mass units, or AMU. And according to this atomic formula, the mass of the oxygen that that molecule will take up while burning is about 400 AMU. So that means that the gases that exit the reaction are four parts oxygen by weight for each part of gasoline burned. Of course, plant matter isn't a pure fuel like octane because plants are full of all sorts of not-so-very-combustible molecules that keep the plant alive. So while cigar smoke must certainly take up less oxygen per unit mass than octane, it should be clear that Sir Walter's calculation must have greatly underestimated the weight of the matter that wafted away from his smoldering stogie and into the royal chamber. Fortunately, there is a simple and far more accurate way to measure the weight of smoke. Okay, so Sir Walter's method failed because he smoked his cigar in an oxygen atmosphere. After all, if you think about it, if you heat something to a high enough temperature, it should break down whether there's oxygen present or not. That's because the heat, or thermal energy in a substance, is merely the total kinetic energy of all of the atoms inside of it. Transferring thermal energy into a solid increases the amplitudes at which its atoms vibrate. At some point, the thermal energy of the atoms exceeds the binding energy that holds them together, and the molecules literally shake apart into what we refer to as pyrolysis products. Pyrolysis, from the Greek pyro meaning fire and lysis meaning to separate. Chemists also call the process of using heat to break large molecules into smaller ones cracking. The molecular fragments that shake loose will move off into space and collectively, they form the smoke. 
If there is no oxygen available, these molecules will essentially contain only atoms that were originally in the plant. So if you measure the weight of the material before and after cracking, the difference will be very nearly equal to the weight of the material that escaped into the air. Now, removing the oxygen is actually a lot easier to do than it may sound. You just put the thing you're roasting inside a covered container and turn up the heat. It turns out that at atmospheric pressure, smoke expands about a thousand times the volume of the mass that burns, which is why a burning building fills so rapidly with the stuff. And so the expanding gas very quickly pushes out every molecule of air inside the container. Just make sure that the container isn't sealed so tightly that the gas can't escape, because if it can't, then the pressure will build up inside until the container explodes, and that's never good for anybody. Fortunately, some cigars just so happen to come in their own containers that are perfectly suited for this experiment. This one just happens to be made of aluminum, which is just a little thicker than what you'd find in an aluminum can. I hate wasting resources on single-use items, and since this happens to be an ideal size for use in the micro-kiln I made in a previous video, I'm going to first convert the cigar tube into a do-it-yourself crucible that can be used in many different experiments. Make sure to remove the thin veneer of cedar wood that's used to keep the humidity inside the tube at a cigar-friendly level, as well as the plastic lining on the inside of the cap. And if you need more of these tubes for future experiments, you can probably get them for the asking from any local cigar lounge. Now, of course, you don't need to use a microkiln for this experiment. You could, for instance, just clamp the cigar tube to a ring stand, rest the screw tap loosely on top, and apply heat with a handheld torch. But I like to do things in a bit more controlled fashion, so I'm going to show you how to carry out experiments like this one using an instrument that is designed to do precisely that. First, we need to remove the paint, and the easiest way to do that is to bake it out in our micro kiln. Just drop the cigar tube into the kiln, set the set point to 450 degrees C, and place it in a well-ventilated area for about 30 minutes. You'll find that the residue that remains on the surface can be removed with a careful application of a little friction using a few paper towels, or of course, a buffing wheel if you happen to have one. Now, to protect the metal from oxidation that happens at high temperatures, I'm going to paint the tube and the lid inside and out with three coats of a high temperature spray paint of the kind used to paint barbecue grills. Once that's set, Use a utility knife to drill a small hole in the center of the lid. This will let the gases escape with a little bit of pressure behind them so that they'll tend to be propelled up and out of the kiln without the smoke penetrating and fouling the ceramic insulation. To begin the experiment, carefully weigh the crucible. Then weigh the cigar. Then drop the cigar inside. First, we're going to drive out the water by raising the temperature to about 120 degrees centigrade and letting it bake out for a couple of hours. Weigh the crucible every 30 minutes or so. When the weight stops falling, you're done. Record the dry weight. If you're using an electronic balance, you have to be a little careful when making this measurement because if the temperature of the pan changes while you're doing it, it may affect the calibration and foul the result. So zero the balance with a folded up paper towel on top to act as an insulator and weigh the hot specimen quickly on that. You need to carry out the next step in an exceptionally well ventilated place because the stuff that you're about to unleash is really nasty. Anoxically cracking these large molecules yields a lot of dangerous chemicals such as methanol, tars, and turpentines that would otherwise be burned up. Trust me, one good whiff will send you bolting to the nearest window, so make sure to take the proper precautions. It's best to do this outside, but if you live in tight quarters with your neighbors, you should be able to vent the smoke safely using your kitchen fan. For experiments like this one, I usually block up my microkiln so it comes just a centimeter or two below the vent. I left a larger gap here than you should because I wanted to make sure you'd be able to see the smoke clearly on this video, but I don't recommend it. I suggest you leave just enough space to tell when the reaction has stopped. With that said, turn your kitchen fan on high and set the set point on the kiln to 450 degrees centigrade. 
Adjust the power to medium just to keep the reaction moving along at a cautious rate and let things cook. Smoke should start to appear at around 300 degrees C and it should start bellowing out as the temperature continues to climb. A bright side light will make even faint featherings of smoke visible. Keep the heat on until all traces of smoke have vanished. When the reaction is complete, turn the heat off and let everything cool down until the temperature falls below 100 degrees C. Then remove the crucible and let it cool to near room temperature before opening it. Now to the unveiling. Here's what the cigar looked like when we started, and here's the charcoalized version that we created. I don't know about you, but I find the shrunken cigar briquette so perfectly formed to be a very satisfying thing to see. To find the true weight of the smoke that was liberated during this process, we need to subtract the weight of what's left. Let's see, that's 5.48 grams from the stuff we started off with. The dry weight of the cigar was 12.25 grams. And so the weight of matter that left the cigar was 6.76 grams. And that's how one determines the true weight of smoke. Let's appreciate what this means. Just over 55% of the cigar's dry mass was broken down into other chemicals that escaped into the air. And it's quite natural for an inventive spirit to ask, well, just what can we do with those other chemicals? And the answer to that question proved to be, change the world. Folks have been extracting useful materials by thermally cracking wood, coal, and peat, amongst other organic stocks, for centuries. For example, seafaring nations have been anoxically roasting the resinous fatwood of pine trees for 600 years to produce pine tars to waterproof their ships. Back in Columbus's day, you couldn't have a navy without it. In the 1600s, Europe's primary supplier happened to be Sweden. But in 1705, when Russia invaded Sweden and stemmed the flow of this vital liqueur, England turned to the vast pine forests of her colonies in the New World to provide them with the raw materials they needed to achieve military supremacy on the open ocean. By 1725, 80% of England's pine tar flowed through the Carolinas. And the prospect of losing that vital resource certainly factored into King George's thinking when he made the decision to go to war with his rebellious colonies when they declared their independence in 1776. There are hundreds of stories that testify to the historical importance of the chemicals that the scientists who came before us learned to extract from nature using this remarkably simple method. And while modern chemists have found cheaper and easier ways of producing most of these chemicals, at least on an industrial scale, it is still very instructive and indeed quite satisfying to learn to do it at home. And so, in a future video, I'm going to show you how to capture and isolate some of the more useful of these chemicals for the sheer delight of it and for those who want to survive the zombie apocalypse. Now, if you like this video, please smash that like button and don't forget to share it with your friends and colleagues. For the Citizen Scientist Workshop, I'm Sean Carlson. Happy sciencing, everybody, and I'll see you in the next one.